Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In part one of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Friedrich Nietzsche is going to discuss virtue, Tugend in German, and the virtues in the plural. There's two main sections in which there are sustained discussions of this. One is in of joys and passions, and in that Nietzsche is providing you his own views, in of course the mouth of Zarathustra, on virtues and, and whether they're something good to have and how they ought to be understood and how they ought to be managed. And then in the on the chairs of virtue, he is setting out a fairly representative and, in his view, mistaken conception of the nature of virtue. And, and we could talk here about false virtues or a false conception of virtue and a truer or right conception of virtue. <clears throat> so we should look first at this, this section of the chairs of virtue. Here, Zarathustra is going along with the young men. Remember, Zarathustra is around 30 years old at this time, so he's not a youth, but he's not middle-aged yet. He hears a wise man praised who is said to discourse well on two topics, virtue, but also sleep. So he's giving people advice about sleep and what you need to do in order to have good, deep, fulfilling sleep. And it turns out that virtue plays an important role in this. So the wise man says, honor to sleep and modesty before it. This is the first thing. Avoid all who sleep badly and are awake at night. Uh, sleeping is no mean art. You know, you have to do things in order to be able to sleep well. And he comes up with what he calls his 40 thoughts, which is kind of interesting to explore. He says, you must overcome yourself 10 times a day. That causes a fine weariness and is opium to the soul. So when you want to eat more than you should, okay, overcome yourself. And that would be a virtue. That would be temperance, right? Uh, when you get angry with somebody and you don't retaliate, you hold yourself back. Okay, that would be overcoming yourself. And we could go on and on and on. So 10 times a day, you're supposed to do that. 10 times you must be reconciled to yourself again, overcoming his bitterness and the unreconciled man sleeps badly. You must discover 10 truths a day. Otherwise you will seek truth in the night. Your soul will be hungry. So we could talk about the intellectual virtues in that case or, you know, curiosity. And then he says you must laugh and be cheerful 10 times a day or your stomach will disturb you in the night. And then he says, few know it, but if you want to sleep well, you must have all of the virtues. And this is actually a big issue in the field that we call virtue ethics. Can a person just have one virtue or do you really need to have all of the virtues? Are the virtues truly separate from each other or are they brought together in a kind of harmony with each other if they're properly understood? This is something that Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, the Epicureans, all these people all the way down to the present have, have thought about in terms of the virtues. This guy is saying you need to have all of the virtues or you're not going to sleep well at night. And he gives us examples. Shall I bear false witness? Shall I commit adultery? Shall I covet my neighbor's maidservant? None of this would be consistent with good sleep. And you might say, well, I'm not hearing the virtues being discussed there. Well, you know, temperance as opposed to lust, right? or justice as opposed to greediness, or pick whatever you want. If you don't have the virtues, this goes, well, you're not going to sleep well because you're going to do things that you shouldn't do or you're going to desire to do things that you, you shouldn't do, and then you're not going to sleep. And then he, he goes on 
And he says something really quite interesting. Even when one has all the virtues, there's still one other thing to remember. To send even these virtues to sleep at the proper time. So sleep takes priority over the virtues. The virtues are there to serve sleep, restfulness, you know, happiness, whatever it is that we're, we're considering it to, to be the, the central goal. Why would your virtues have to be put to sleep? Well, because otherwise, he recognizes this, there's a tendency for virtues themselves to, as motives of the human being, to go a bit too far to fall into conflict with each other. He says, that they may not quarrel amongst themselves, the pretty little women and over you unhappy man. And so the idea is like the virtues are sort of like jealous, uh, you know, people flirting with you or wanting to be in a relationship with you and each is pulling you one way against the other. And you're not going to really be happy if they're fighting with each other. So if you really want to have a good life, only go so far with the virtues. Just enough to make yourself feel good, to feel all right about yourself so you can have some good sleep. And Zarathustra um, hears all of this and he says, well, um, his wisdom is stay awake in order to sleep well. And truly, if life had no sense and I had to choose nonsense, this, this would be the most desirable for me, too. Um, it's clear what people were once seeking above all when they sought the teachers of virtue, the philosophers, the sages. They sought good sleep and opium virtues to bring it about. So these people don't actually have some idea of the meaning of life. Um, and they don't really have a, what we could call noble conception of the virtues. So what does Nietzsche offer in place of this? To this, we need to turn to the section which is called of joys and passions. And there's three main things, three main discussions in there that are important to go over. The first is, he says, if you have a virtue and it is your own virtue, it belongs to you, then you have it in common with no one. Combines them. There's no, there's no commonality. There's no universality. And he cautions us against naming it. Now, why don't we want to name it? I mean, this is an instinct in human beings. We, we always want to be able to say, you know, what is it that I'm feeling? What is it that I'm thinking? What is it that I'm experiencing? The, the naming of something, in some respects, is liberate, liberatory or it's, it's powerful, right? It feels good to be able to finally say, oh, that feeling of coziness that's created by having, you know, comforters and candles. Oh, that's, you know, hugli, right? In, in Danish. Or uh, that, that wish to hurt somebody and see them fail or, you know, be in pain for, for you know, not for the sake of anything else, but um, just because of that schadenfreude, right? We, when we have a word, we like it. But that's dangerous when it's our own virtue. Why? He says, um, now you have its name in common with the people and you've become of the people and the herd with your virtue. So when you're able to figure out what it is that you actually exhibit and you're like courage, well, your courage is just like the other person's courage or the other person's courage or the other person's courage. And eventually it doesn't mean quite so much to you. It's no longer yours. So he says, you would be better saying unutterable and nameless is that which torments and delights my soul and is also the hunger of my belly. When you have a genuine virtue, when you're not just going through the motions, it becomes part of you. It expresses part of you and it moves you. It drives you to do things in your own way that other people aren't doing. It sets you apart so he says, let your virtue be too exalted for the familiarity of names. If you have to speak of it, don't be ashamed to stammer. Thus say, this is my good, this I love. Just thus do I like it. Only thus do I wish the good. Make it your own. Make it belong to you. He says, I don't want it as a law of God. I don't want it as a human statute. Let it be no signpost to super earths and paradises. I love an earthly virtue. 
And he says there's little prudence, klugheit, cleverness in it, and least of all, common wisdom or reason. So this is a very different conception of virtue. It, typically, when we're thinking about virtue ethics, we say, ah, you know, we all start out kind of messed up, and then we look to people that we think are virtuous, and we say, I'm going to be like that person over there, and, you know, if I, if I make some progress towards them, like towards Socrates or Epictetus or Aristotle or whoever, then I'm going to be a good person. We identify ourselves with somebody else, the traits that they have. Nietzsche is saying we should do something different instead. We should, um, he says, this bird has built its nest beneath my roof. Therefore, I love and cherish it. Now it sits there upon its golden eggs. So there's a contingency to it. Not all of us are made or born or generated to have the same virtue or set of virtues as everyone else. And so that's one one key idea. Another key idea is that the virtues themselves, rather than being ways that we sort of manage our passions and actions, are actually arising out of our passions. He says they grow out of our Leidenschaften is the the German expression for it, the things that we suffer, the things that we are gripped by, the things that move us, right? And so we have these passions, and early on we view them as evil, he says. But now you have only your virtues. They grew out from your passions. You laid your highest aim or goal, zeal, in those passions, you took them on and you said, wow, you know, I'm kind of a lustful person. I'm kind of a greedy person. I'm kind of a driven for status person. I'm, you know, this and this. I'm going to say, okay, that, that, that's who I am. That's what's driving me. I'm going to embrace that. And in the embracing of it, rather than denying it, repressing it, curbing it, they're allowed to become transformed. He doesn't say how this happens precisely, but we could imagine a process where you like look at it and you're like, well, uh, I, I am a re- revenge seeker. I'll do it in this case, but not in this case. And I'll be the one to decide how that passion gets uh, framed, how, how that happens. So he says, your passions have become virtues. All your devils have become angels. You had fierce dogs in your cellar, but they changed into birds and sweet singers. From your poison, you brewed your balsam, something that you can use as an ointment to cure, right? You milked your cow affliction. Now you drink the sweet milk. And he says, henceforth, nothing evil shall come out of you unless it be the evil that comes from the conflict of your virtues. So now we get the third key idea. First one, Keep your mouth shut about your virtues. Don't share them with everybody else. The second, they they grow out of our passions. The third is that we're going to have conflicts between our virtues. Unlike the, you know, teacher of virtue who says, oh, make sure they don't conflict with each other. Or the philosophers who say, well, if it's a true virtue, it's not going to conflict with anything else. Nietzsche says multiple virtues are going to lead to conflict, to contradiction, to strife between them inside of you. And that's not going to always feel good because you're the battleground. You are the one who's being pulled and driven in different places. So he he goes on and he says, to have many virtues is to be distinguished, but it's a hard fate. You're almost better off just having one virtue rather than a whole bunch of them. Because that one virtue, it's not going to conflict with the other virtues. He says, many a man has gone into the desert and killed himself because he was tired of being a battle and a battleground of virtues. Then he asks, are war and battle evil? This evil is necessary. What's necessary about it? Envy, mistrust, calumny among your virtues is necessary. Let's consider the cardinal virtues, temperance, courage, wisdom, and justice. If Nietzsche is correct, these will go to war against each other. And in what sense? Well, they're going to envy each other's places. They're going to say bad things about each other. It's not going to be one nice harmony within oneself. Why? Because each of your virtues is part of you. It's part of what he later is going to call your will to power. It's a will that strives to dominate the others. He says, 
Each of your virtues desires the highest place. It wants your entire spirit, your entire mind, that your spirit may be its herald. It wants to take you over and make you its own and use you to announce itself. It wants your entire strength in what? In anger, zorn, hate, has, and love, liebe. He tells you that every virtue is jealous of the others and jealousy is a terrible thing and that even the virtues can be destroyed through this jealousy. The virtues can not only war against each other and make you miserable as a result, the virtues can even turn upon themselves in that jealousy within you. So being good, being noble, doesn't solve all your problems. And as a matter of fact, raising your virtues to the highest extent, according to Nietzsche, if they're genuine virtues, may not always make you happy and calm and peaceful. It may actually make your life much more complicated. Should you have virtues then? Nietzsche thinks that you ought to. You ought to take your passions, transform them into virtues, but realize that if you're being realistic about this, they are going to go to war with each other and you have to carefully manage not just your, your you know, outside things by use of the virtues. So managing your consumption of food or intoxicants or sexual pleasures by, by use of temperance. You have to make sure that that temperance doesn't get out of bounds and start overwhelming your courage or your wisdom or your justice or your magnanimity or this virtue or that virtue or something else that it doesn't dominate your entire being. This is a very interesting and unconventional view of the virtues that Nietzsche is articulating here. 